All right, let's do some more algebra. And now we're talking about modules. So we did talk about this a little bit in one of the other videos because we sort of brought it up and then didn't talk about it. But now we're going to talk about it. So a module is, and this is an easy definition. I know I went into a whole spiel um, in the other video about like, you have a sort of a map, um, which it, the action is sort of in a sense a morphism both through or yeah it's like a morphism both with respect to r and m but this is an easy definition uh you've got an abelian group m and a map that goes from any ring r cross m to m r doesn't have to be abelian or commutative here this can be any ring r um and we'll just write these elements as rm and it satisfies R of M1 plus M2 is RM1 plus RM2. Um, same thing with the, um, if you take two things in R, then it does that. Then you got that. And then you got that. Um, and again, um, with, uh, with multiplication in a ring being just a monoid, you always have to be a little careful with your definitions using one. Typically, you have to state something about one. Like here, we have to state that one times m equals m. Um, but from this condition, you can prove that zero times m is equal to m. Um, but you cannot conclude, well, is that, is that, is that the right one? Well, from, from some of the stuff you can conclude that 0m equals 0, but you have to, you, you have to like have in, as part of your definition that 1 times m equals m. But typically, that happens a lot. You need to, the definition involves 1, but you're, you're like automatically able to conclude stuff about 0. Um, and then negative signs move around. This is all stuff I haven't gone into a lot of detail here, but it's just, some symbol pushing, it's not too hard. Um, also, if you think of R given its addition, then we know that rings, ad rings with respect to their addition is always going to be an abelian group, because that's by definition. So this is a left R module, and so what you have is if you take two elements in R here, the multiplication for this module is just going to be the multiplication that you have in the ring. Um, and not only that, but if you have an ideal in R, then this ideal is a left submodule of R, meaning that um, it is a sub it's a subset of R. But it is a module in and of itself, so it's a submodule. That's what I mean by submodule. It's basically exactly what you would expect it to mean. Um, you can also quotient by an ideal and get a left R module. And so, yeah, that's just going to be if you take R applied to R plus A, or if you take R1 and apply it to R2 plus A, then you, it would just be R1 times R2 plus A. And that would be your action and you can prove that all this stuff works but this is all just like it's easy enough that we're not even going to like prove it if r happens to be commutative then basically talking about left modules and right modules are pretty much the same thing um so yeah in in this lecture pretty much whenever they say r module what you should really say is a left module, like a left R module. But I just decided to leave it out because if it's like, because it's always going to be a left module. I don't really talk about right modules and it doesn't really matter that much which one you're using. So I just say a module. But for, um, for commutative rings, everyone just calls it a module because it doesn't matter if it's left or right. Whereas here you technically have to distinguish between left modules and right modules if it's a not commutative but basically anywhere here if i say r module and r is not assumed to be commutative then i mean a left r module all right so 
suppose we have a ring R and we have a collection of some modules. So we have some indexing set capital I. And for every single I in here, we have a module M. And I could be any set. It could be finite. It could be countable. It could be uncountable. We don't know. We don't care. Um, then we can construct a set which is going to be called the direct sum of the MIs. Um, so what it is is it's all sort of elements of this form um, where for every single MI you choose some XI and then you sort of put them together as a coordinate pair. So it's sort of like... Um, yeah, it's it's just like a collection of the XIs where you've got a particular XI for every single I in capital I. Um, but also it's important here that only finitely many of these XIs are non-zero. And that's sort of how we account for this, uh, the, the fact that I could be possibly like uncountable. In order to make this work nicely, you need to make sure that XI is zero for all but finitely many indices. And this is the direct sum of the module of the MIs. And it's an R module. And the way, so the way that R acts on an element is, well, you just bring it inside. Um, so instead of R acting on this entire element of the direct sum, what this becomes is this it's basically the um, the element given by you like bring the R inside every single coordinate um, and of course because each XI belong the, this multiple for every single I in capital I this multiplication is the multiplication that takes place in the module capital MI um, so this works out nicely um, so I think we may have mentioned this before, maybe we didn't, but a, mo a, ho a homomorphism between modules or an R linear map, um, basically it's a map. So this should be a map F and it will go from M to M. So well, actually, M1 to M2 because M1 and M2 do not need to be the same module, but they need to be modules over the same ring. So M1 and M2 both have to be R modules. Um, and the way that this works is that if you take M1 and M2, which are both in capital M1, then F of this thing is this thing, which is kind of what you'd expect um, for... You would expect this to happen to addition for a, a morphism. This is just like what we see in like everything else. Um, but then we also have this condition where if you apply F to R applied to M, so here R is an R and M is an M1, then this is going to be R applied to FM. And so since M is in M, capital M1, F of M is in capital M2. So this R times F of M, this multiplication right here is multiplication in the module capital M2. So that's why these both need to be modules over the same ring R, is in order for this to make sense. And this is sort of, the, this also shows you why you have, why this is called linearity, because this is exactly what we mean when we talk about vec like vector spaces, or having linear maps between vector spaces. It means that if you apply the map to two vector, the sum of two vectors, it means you can apply it to the two vectors separately. And you, if you have a scalar inside here, you can pull it out front. All right, so that's that. Um, and then like a whole bunch, like all this other stuff that we've been talking about with rings, we've got a universal property. So given an R module P in addition to the MIs um, and a collection of R linear maps. So for every single I and I, we're gonna have a map FI, which will go from MI to P. So if we're given some collection of these FIs, then there exists a unique R linear map that goes from the direct sum of the MIs to P, which is, and the what this map is given by is you take 
any element in the direct sum um, and you send it to just the sum over all i and i of um, fi evaluated at xi. And so here this uses, um, note that this maps into uh, the module p because this is a finite sum. And that's because xi is going to be non-zero only for finitely many i's. And um, of course, if xi is equal to zero, then f of then fi of xi is also going to be zero because fi is a R linear map. And linear maps send zero to zero because you just set r equal to zero. And you pull it out front and it works. So um, so this is a finite sum. So this is a sum of finitely many elements of P and modules are closed under finite sums but not necessarily countable or arbitrary sums. So that's why we needed, um, that's sort of why we needed, well, you could either see it, we needed to have this condition here in order to make this universal property work or you could think of it as um, it's natural to think of the universal property working in this way because we have this and so it allows us to do this. Um, I'm not really quite sure which came first, the universal property or the, um, the direct sum itself. Um, but the important thing here is that it works because this sum is finite and so we get something that's in the module. All right, so that's a direct sum. A direct product is just the same thing, but we have no finiteness con condition. It's just an ordered pair of, or an ordered, it's, it's basically a vector. Um, but instead of, like a vector is like you've got finitely many coordinates and you label them one through n for whatever n is. Here, we've got a, per we've got one coordinate for every single element in capital I. Um, but yeah, so it's just this thing, okay? And it's an R module again, and the R module is basically this exact same thing. Um, oh, I guess we should note that up here, if you apply this, then xi, if xi is zero, then R of xi is going to be zero. So this is also going to be, all these xi's are going to be, um, all but finitely many of these rxi's are going to be zero because all but finitely many xi's are zero. And so this actually gives you an element in the direct sum. And likewise, obviously this gives us, this gives us a element in the direct sum because if we just define it like this, then there's no other conditions that you need to check. Um, and we have a universal property here as well, but here it sort of goes backwards. So if we have our linear maps GI, but instead of going from MI to P, here we go from P to MI. Then there exists an R linear map that goes from P to this, um, this direct product where you take an element X in P and then for every single I in I, the corresponding coordinate is g i of x. And so x is not zero per se. So we don't have any zero conditions on the g i's. It, it could very easily be that the set of i such that g i x is non-zero is far more than finite. It could be countable, it could be uncountable, but that's fine because for direct products, we don't care about how many of these xi's are finite. And so this actually works here um, if we do it this way. Um, it's just that, so if you go from P to the mi's, then you're able to have these, um, then you're able to make it work with direct products. But if you go, if you have these maps from the mi's to P, then you have to be working with direct sums in order to make everything work. All right, so also observe if capital I is a finite set, then the direct sum and direct product are the same thing because this extra condition automatically holds 
here. So these two sets are exactly the same thing. All right. What else? There's another example. Um, you could take mi to be r for every single i because we know that r is a left r module. Um, and then you could take the direct sum of the mi's. Nope, looking at the wrong line. r raised to the, and then you put i in parentheses. This is defined as the direct sum of the uh, of r. And r just to the power of i is just the product of this. And then r to the i in parentheses is called a free r module. And that is apparently important in algebra, especially if you go on to I think more like homological algebra will talk about these types of things, but I don't think we're going to go into this much. This is sort of just to give you like a introduce you to the thing. And like, since we've done all the work, we might as well mention that, oh yeah, these are a thing that people talk about and study. Um, but yeah, so yeah, that's all I got for now about modules and stuff and next time we're actually going to start proving things so we'll move on to that